It was Christmas morning and I woke up and I didn't have any Christmas things. My mom didn't care. She didn't want me there and she told me to leave. I was homeless for a year. I would cry all the time. I had nowhere to go. I just realized like I'm homeless. Like what am I gonna do? I have two kids. I thought like I would never be that person. Never be one of them homeless people. And then I was and I don't know, it was hard. A homeless single mom with two small children. It's a story like many stories of students and families who are homeless on the streets of our community every night. You might not see someone with a cardboard sign, but we truly do have homelessness in our community. It's hidden. Um, people, are, people are doubled up with family and friends. Um, there are people sleeping outside, but not on the side of freeways, not on underpasses. They're sleeping in the woods, they're sleeping at the Coon Rapids Dam, they're sleeping at community parks, so they're not as visible as they are in the inner city. This used to be where all my stuff was. Mattress right in that opening right there. Duffel bag full of clothes and books laying around. Shows what can happen to a lot of people. Could happen to anybody, really. A 2009 survey by the Wilder Foundation found that approximately 13,000 individuals are homeless on any given night in Minnesota. In Anoka County, during that same period, 1,300 individuals were homeless. 155 of them were youth. I think it's important to identify homelessness, to identify our families and students in need. Um, they're part of our community. And if we allow people to hurt, if we allow people to suffer, you know, and we do we close our eyes and pretend, well, I don't know you personally, so I don't have to deal with you. Why don't your family help you? Or why don't your friends help you? The truth is, not all of us have that luxury of having family and or friends. A federal law, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, ensures that children experiencing homelessness have full and equal access to a public education. Every school district in the country is required under federal law to provide certain things for homeless families. Um, we need to make sure that there are no barriers when students want to be enrolled in school. So if a student comes and identifies themselves as homeless to school, they need to be enrolled immediately. None of the following may be barriers to the enrollment of a homeless student. Proof of residency. Proof of guardianship. Proof of identity. Birth certificate. Immunizations. Medical records. And school records. Under the McKinney-Vento Act, the Anoka Hennepin School District applied for and received a grant for the 2010 to 2012 school years. The grant will help the district provide resources and support and training for staff. In order to be most effective and to act quickly, Anoka Hennepin turned to the YMCA for its extensive community connections. The partnership with the Emma B. Howe YMCA will strengthen our support to homeless students and youth. The YMCA is in a unique position to partner with the Anoka Hennepin School District because we have a really strong passion to work with youth and families to find them stable housing in the community and to connect them with the community resources that they need. I believe that all staff in Anoka Hennepin some point in their day will come across a homeless student. So for example, an attendance secretary, they might notice um, a student missing a lot of days or really having inconsistent attendance. I think it's very important for them to say, you know what, there might be something going on here. And then to immediately connect with that homeless lead in their building to take a deeper look at it. Each school has designated a homeless lead. This staff member connects homeless students with a caring adult in the building. My job as the homeless lead is to I help to identify students that are in homeless situations. Primarily that will come from other staff members, teachers that have gotten to know the students and have discovered that they are in homeless situations. Um, the guidance counselors with whom I work very closely have helped to identify some of those students. Um, so when I become aware that these students may be in a homeless situation, um, I will then meet with them individually, um, get some, gather some information, fill out some paperwork, make sure that that's submitted to the district, um, share the information with Carrie and Abby at the Y, and then work together to try to meet the needs. The homeless lead also contacts the Student Services Department to account for each case of homelessness. When I receive that call from the homeless lead, we go through the form that he fills out to confirm in the student's situation and what the family needs. After I get all that information from the lead, I go to Del Zomer, who's our homeless liaison, 
for our district and we go over the situation. I go ahead and contact transportation because these students get uh, free transportation. If they are in the district, they will get a bus to school. If they are not in the district, we will send them um, a taxi, uh, ensure that they get free breakfast and lunch, and then we also see what other supplies they need. Identifying homeless youth can be difficult. Warning signs of homelessness vary from student to student, but often they follow consistent patterns. Along with students missing um, school and having real inconsistent attendance, you might see a consistent pattern with tardiness. So if a youth is couch hopping and staying at a different location every night, they might have different means of transportation getting back and forth to school. Then when they do get to school, are they looking really tired? Are they maybe wearing the same clothes that they wore the day before? Uh, maybe they're coming in and it's 30 below and they don't have a winter coat on or they don't have a hat, jacket, um, gloves. Some of the warning signs that I have seen tiredness, withdrawn, thinking about geometry is not the first thing on their mind. And so they are, they're, they're, or they're isolated. I mean, even shame. Their hygiene is changing, so they have the body odor. They're not brushing their teeth or not combing their hair. Um, and that's come from not being where they have those things accessible to them. No phone number, the phone number doesn't work. Um, even though there's multiple phone numbers, it doesn't work. Or even the emergency contacts, there's one or maybe two names listed but those numbers don't work. You know, I've seen students who have worn maybe the same outfit, if not every single day, every single week. So they, they recycle or rotate that same outfit. Students' participation in the after-school events or on field trips is something that we really look for because kids who, you know, it's a real fun a field trip and they're not returning the field trip slips. They're usually the last ones that come in or they'll come in and there's no money attached. Students try to cover up their poverty and homelessness, including when the school asks for permission slips and fees. Homeless students have the right to participate in all school opportunities, including field trips and before and after school programs. Uh, as a school nurse, some of the warning signs that I see of homelessness are unmet uh, medical and dental needs, chronic fatigue, hunger, respiratory infections that aren't being resolved, uh, skin infections, skin rashes. We usually just try to give them a lot of extra support if we, um, we work well with the kitchen staff. You know, if it's a hunger issue, we try to go get something for them to eat and so that way they can kind of rest and get, you know, just be somewhere warm and safe in the health office. When I was a classroom teacher, um, one of the things that really sticks out in my mind is I had a young lady in one of my homeroom classes and we were watching a video and I noticed that she was eating during the video and we don't typically have food in the classroom. Then after class, I pulled her aside and I said, you know, everything okay? And found out through talking that she was eating paper. And she'd been eating paper because she hadn't been getting meals at home. Um, this was a student who was living in a home that was not meant for human habit habitation, didn't have heat, didn't have running water, um, was really in disarray, and there was no food in the home. And then we did have someone um, from the county go connect with the family and make sure that they um, were able to get the things that they needed to have a safe, stable home. Um, but the most important thing was paying attention to those warning signs. If you see a student who typically is really engaged, um, sits in the front of the class, and is really interactive, and then all of a sudden that changes. Maybe now they're sitting in the back of the classroom, they're not engaged, they're not playing at recess, or maybe they're sitting by themselves in the lunchroom. You notice that change in mood or behaviors or choice of friends. Um, looking at those kind of things because it causes a lot of stress to experience homelessness. Psychologically, these students are in survival mode. Their job is to survive, is to stay warm, to get something in their stomach, and that is, uh, for those that don't actually have a place to stay, I'm sure that is oftentimes the case that they're looking for, okay, where am I going to sleep tonight? That's a much higher priority for them than studying for a test or completing a homework assignment. Um, so where they're at mentally and psychologically is going to be much different than the typical teenager that you know, lives with mom and dad and has a warm place to stay and doesn't even have to think about those things. Those are just given. For a homeless student, that's not given. That's maybe a daily struggle. While at the school, our primary role is to educate, we understand that before they can learn, they have to have those basic needs met. And not only the basic needs, but emotionally. Um, they really need a lot of support. And that's why it's really important that we identify them so that we can surround them with the support they need. Before you approach a student you might think is homeless, remember, it's a delicate matter.
I have found it actually easiest for them to, to open up or to share when it's been one on one. Um, I have found it that it's very rare for them to share with our school district when there's a team of us um, talking to the parents or talking to the students. But if I am able to speak to a student one on one or a family member one on one, um, they're more likely to admit or to, to share that we are struggling and that we are um, going through a difficult time. I think it's important to remember that every single staff member in the district really has an opportunity to get to know the kids. And once you know them and you see something that's changed, something that's different, it's really important to not just go, oh, you know, it's just that age, it's just this, because it might be something more. Take the time to get to know the kids. Take the time to talk to the other professionals in your building. And if your gut feeling says that something needs to be done, go to somebody in your building and voice your concern. If any staff member in our building, such as a para, um, the school cook, bus driver, custodian, um, gets a sense that a student might be in a homeless situation, their job would be to contact me either through email or um, a direct conversation to say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. I wonder if we need to look into this. And my role would then be to, to check it out and see what's going on. It's really important for these kids to have some sense of continuity in their education. Each school district uses different curriculum, has different um, processes, and for them to just have to recreate this wheel every time they go into a new building, um, they're losing that valuable academic time. Studies show that four to six months of academic learning is lost every time a child moves from one school to another. So you move twice during a school year and you've lost that entire year. With the McKinney Vento Grant, we have developed a homeless section. To find this page, you go to the main page of the district website, mouse over district, click on district departments, find student services, and click on that. In the left-hand column, click on homeless programs. From this page, you can report if you suspect a family or student of being homeless. If you scroll to the bottom under the picture of the file cabinets and click on the words and from here you can click into other resources. There's information on McKinney Vento. You can find out who the lead in your building is and you can print off the resource sheets. The warning signs of homelessness can be difficult to detect. Here are some things to look for. Erratic attendance and tardiness. Numerous absences lack of personal records needed to enroll, inability to contact parents, lack of participation in school activities and field trips, unmet medical and dental needs, lack of immunization or medical records, poor personal hygiene, respiratory problems, skin rashes, chronic hunger, fatigue, disengagement in class, isolation from former friends, mood swings, and abrupt changes in behavior. If you know or suspect that a student or family are in a homeless situation, contact the homeless lead in your building or Ann Heath in the Student Services Department. Contact information is located at the district website. As educators, we got into this field because we care for students. We want to make their lives better and help them be all that they can be. For students that find themselves in homeless situations, they desperately need our assistance and our help because they can't do it alone. They need the resources and more than anything they need love and compassion and caring that we as educators can provide that perhaps no one else can.